Okay, welcome to the fourth part of week two, Perception, Cognitive Psychology Lecture, and this part will be on Depth Perception. Okay, let me click here. No, okay, so Depth Perception. Depth Perception is about localizing objects in our surrounding in a three-dimensional world. So, for instance, if we want to cross the road, we have to estimate what's the distance of an approaching car. Can we still cross? Or is it already too close and too fast? Or as an exa another example, we have to be able to navigate in our environment. And not only in these complicated mazes, but already, you know, in our houses or apartments or flats or in, in on the streets and things like that. So for that, it's good to have a representation of the depth around us. And when we want to do that, we have to be aware that this is actually a challenging task. Because what we have are two eyes, and each eye gets a two-dimensional image. And from these two-dimensional image, we have to recreate or create a three-dimensional perception. And in this part, we will have a look at how our cognitive system is doing that and establish that. It's doing that in general by, again, constructing things and interpreting things around us. Okay, there are a number of which has been called uh, binocular or monocular cues in depth perception. And we will go through a couple of them to see what information we can need and what information we usually use to do that. The first cue is I would like to discuss is binocular disparity. What does that mean? So it means that because our two eyes are not at the same point but slightly different spatially, they view the world from a slightly different angle. And that when objects are more distant, this angle results in something which is called disparity. You will see that in a moment. And this changes that. So suppose you see these bowling pins. We are strictly one behind each other and we are right in the middle in front of them. Then our left eye sees something like this and the right eye sees these pins like that. And we just have this true representation. Now what happens if we focus on the pin in the front as compared to a pin in the middle or in the back or something? What happens is, look here, this point B, when we focus that one, then it will fall on this point on the retina and the other one on this point. The point A, which is further away, will not like on the left of the blue one and here also on the left. Now here it will be on the right and here on the left. So it's moved towards the inner side. And this is called the disparity. When we have a further point to see, then we see it has a disparity here as well. So it's on different places. It's not on the equivalent places in the left and right eye, but instead on different places relative to each other. The point is, when in space B and C have the same distance as A and B from each other, that this disparity on our retina becomes the larger, the closer the objects are. So very close objects have a large disparity, so disparity helps us a lot to determine the depth, the distance from us of these objects, but the further it goes away, the smaller the disparity gets. And roughly around two, three meters, disparity is so small that it's actually not useful anymore for us to infer on the depth. Okay, another binocular cue is convergence. And convergence is very simple. If something <clears throat> is far away from us, then the eyes have to turn slightly inward to focus on a point. Oh, I tried to put that in the camera. Now, if you move that much closer to your nose, your eyes need to turn more inwards. 
and our brain has information about the muscles so we know how the eyes are oriented and we know the convergence of our eyes and we can use this information to infer on where we are actually looking how far or close apart this is okay so to demonstrate you the importance of these binocular cues um, let's think how we could test this could you have would you have an idea of how to test whether binocular cues are important or not well because we're talking of binocular cues you could compare your accuracy in a spatial task when you do it with two eyes as compared to one eye only so compare monoocular with binocular vision and for that one of course I don't have very well prepared this session take please two coins if you have like money coins and uh, ideally they have the same size and roughly at full arm's length so suppose you have two coins here um, but not straight roughly angled try to make them touch each other on the edges just do it repeatedly like that with both eyes open you should realize that's not very challenging it's okay okay you can pause the video to try that out okay so when you've tried to do it with both eyes open do the same thing but this time with one eye closed which one you take doesn't matter at all just try to see it with one eye and do the same task do it like this and then like this if you don't have a coin all you can do is just already try to move your fingers but there's so much proprioception involved that this task is a little bit easier even with one eye okay you can pause for a moment to try that out okay so you probably will have realized that um, it's much easier with both eyes than with a single eye so this bon binocular vision is really helpful for the exact determination of space and depth okay now let's take this pirate he lived at other times but um, still the question would he be allowed to drive a car he only has one eye what do you think and if you come to a conclusion try to justify it provide an argument for that okay the answer is that he would be allowed people can drive a car if they have lost their complete vision in one eye the definition for or one criterion where you are allowed to drive a car is your field of view that needs to be big enough and the field of view which is required to drive a car at least in the European Union is roughly the one you have when you see with one eye it's slightly bigger I think if I remember correctly you need 120 degree vision to drive a car and one eye has roughly 140 degrees 130 degrees visual field you see then with that so we can actually drive with one eye only and the reason for that is if you remember uh, I said there are also monocular cues of depth perception we'll speak about in a moment which help us to determine how distant objects are and I also said that these binocular cues of convergence and disparity they lose their effectiveness and use roughly in one two meter distance or two or three meters or something like that anyway in distances where we need to estimate the depth of objects in driving that's way beyond the effective workings of disparity and convergence but if we don't need two eyes even for driving why do we need them at all they are not built in for redundancy that if we lose one eye like this guy we can still see 
that's a nice side effect. But the key is that for us humans and a lot of an other animals as well, the most important things happen in our direct vicinity, in our close surroundings. And in particular, things like tool use. So if we manipulate something with our hands, this is fully in the operational range of these binocular cues. So for the fine-grained manipulations, where we really need to know the spatial position with millimeter accuracy, we use these binocular cues. And people who only have one eye, they really have, it's, it's tricky for them. Try to put in a thread into a needle with one eye only, that, that's hard. And if people lost vision in one eye, they have to really learn and train them to use other strategies, sometimes with touch, using more touch to, to determine the position. Okay, so as I said, there are two types of information, binocular cues, information from both eyes, we spoke about them. But for driving and other things where it's more long distance, we use monocular cues, which is information where one eye is sufficient to use it. So first, our monocular cue is occlusion. And that basically says that if an object is partly hidden by another object, it must be behind it. So these are just examples. This orange square is behind the blue square. Remember the last part on object, uh, sorry, on the Gestalt principles. Uh, a prerequisite for that perception is that we automatically assume this is a square. If we would assume our perceptual system would say, okay, now this is this uh, like L-shaped thingy which lies on the side, then we may come to a different percept. Same for this one. The green one is behind the red because it's partly covered. And this is something which we also see, for instance, when we have a mountain scenery or something. There are additional effects working here as well, not only occlusion. Another cue which we use and where one eye is sufficient, so it's a monocular cue, is texture gradient. And that is based on the fact that the texture of an object changes with its distance. It may sound complicated, but when you see the images it becomes evident. The size of the bricks gets smaller when it goes further away. And this acre here and stuff. And this even works in very schematic illustrations. You just have lines on a two-dimensional paper here or on the screen, but they create a very strong impression of depth. So these cues are really used by our mind. A further cue is motion parallax, and this refers to moving. So when distant objects move, uh, sorry, when we are moving, then objects which are farther away from us move slower than objects which are close to us. And you may know that when you are sitting in a car or in a train and you look out of the window, the things which are very close to you, like a tree right next to the road, a tr tr train track, just flies by in a blurry way but the stuff which is further away, like houses here, they move much slower. So this is also used for depth perception. Okay. These information or these our mechanisms to infer on depth can actually be fooled by visual illusions. And let's have a couple uh, two different ones of them. And when you watch the video clip on these illusions, remember not only what we have now learned about depth perception, but also, also the Gestalt principles, how they come into being. So this first one, it looks pretty clear. It's this black playing card, then the blue s square, and then the red playing card. Just look at the image and find what happens. You just have a percept and, and then you see what your percept tells you. So the order is actually what we talked 
talked about before. It's because we don't assume that the shape is cut out. We don't can't see it that it's deformed because we automatically assume this is a full playing card. Yeah, this one always. Have a look at another one. Um, so we see this very clear bridge which goes up here, but then there's this weird behavior of the balls and no, it's no trick. to try to see again that <coughs> how it really looks like <coughs> sorry uh, wrong window okay do you have any questions on this then please post them in the BBL internet forums or bring them to the seminar okay thanks for watching and we will then have one more part on this second week, which will be about object recognition.